we've got a big math section here for financing calculations. And I personally believe that this is going to be where you get the most test questions on the exam. And I know that these are financing calculations and you're gonna have a lender that's going to do the majority of this work for you. However, some of these things are still important. Um, debt to income, you will wanna know how to calculate this because we write debt to income on our purchase agreements. We say, buyer tonight not finance more than X percent, um, which means you'd write 90% on the purchase agreement if they're putting 10% down. So this part I will say might come in handy for you, but again, I think a lender is really going to help guide you through this. Loan to value is the relationship between the amount being borrowed and the purchase price you've agreed to with a seller. Now, let me give one caveat to that. If we have a purchase agreement, everyone's agreed to it, buyer and seller, for $200,000. If the appraisal comes in lower, we now have to use the lower number. If it comes in above 200, whatever, you can still use the 200. So it's appraised or purchase price, whichever is lower, okay? Now, the way that I figure out these down payments um, and this loan to value to get percentage, my tip for you is to divide the little number by the big number. That's going to give you like a point something, and then we can calculate it into a percentage. Now, you all know, I'm sure you caught on, or if you haven't, you will soon as we start to get further into reviews. You know that I believe in repetition, repetition, repetition to help get this information um, top of in, in your brain, burned in your brain, right? Here's the goal for when you go to the test center. So I like to do math examples in groups of three. So bear with me. Um, I know you're reading these and maybe doing some math on your own, I hope, when you read it on your own. But now again, like the previous videos, I'm going to review it with you. So let's go here. If we've got a purchase price of $180,000, and a down payment of $9,000. What we would do is we would divide 9,000 by $180,000. So if you divide 9,000 by 180, so 9,000 divided by $180,000, you're gonna get a number of 0 0.05, 0 0.05, which equals, 5%, correct? And if we know that we're putting 5% down, now how much are we borrowing? 95%, correct? Let's do the next one. We've got a purchase price of $300,000 and a down payment of 30,000. So again, Big number into little number or little number divided by big number, however you like to say it. But $30,000 divided by $300,000, $30,000 divided by $300,000 is gonna get you this number, which equals 10%. And now we know if we're putting 10% down, how much are we borrowing? Oops. Oops. This number, correct? 90%. Putting 10 down, we need 90 to make it whole. Last one. $20,000 is the down payment. Purchase price is $100,000. So 20,000 divided by $100,000 
is going to get us a number of 0 0.20, which equals 20% when we do the decimal dance. So what do we need to borrow? What's the loan to value? It's 80%. So the borrower is bringing 20,000 in cash that makes up 10 per or sorry 20% of $100,000 which means they're going to finance with a lender 80% or $80,000. Okay? Next up is this debt to income ratio. And this is another qualifier for someone to obtain a mortgage. What the lender is going to do is they're going to look at what they call a front end and a back end ratio. The front end represents the amount that they can have for house payment. The back end is the relationship of the total amount of debt that they already carry. Debt that would be anything revolving debt that you pay on a monthly basis, credit cards, student loans, car payments, alimony, child support. Those are the big ones. So when they look at someone's percentages, the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to look at their monthly gross income. Before taxes, monthly gross income, and they're going to take 28% 20, um, of that and 36% Got zero other debt, 28% is going to be the maximum that they're allowed to borrow for a home. P-I-T-I. -I. Principal interest, taxes, and insurance. And then if there's any other homeowners association dues, that's going to need to be factored in here as well. Because again, that's a monthly obligation. So 36 is the total debt. 28% is housing debt, P-I-T-I. -I. So again, even if they've got zero debt, they've got no other payment obligations, no student loans, no credit cards, no car payments, the maximum that they can borrow for a house payment, P-I-T-I, -I, is 28%. But if we look at their overall debt and it's more then 8% of their gross income. Now they're going to start to deduct that from the housing because 36% is the overall total debt. See, there's only 8% between 28 and 36% is where I got that number. So if they carry 10% in debt already, they can't do the 28% in housing anymore that now dips down to 26%. Your lenders will absolutely do this for you. This will not be something that you probably do on a regular basis for your buyers. Credit scores and salaries, I leave that to the lender because I think it's very private information. As a real estate agent, I am looking for a pre-approval or a proof of funds or something from a bank authority that says, that they can purchase based on what they know, which is hopefully all this debt to income, loan value, and then credit score. Now, in my experience at the exam center, when you're testing, they will give you these front end and back end numbers. But also in my experience, they've used 28 and 36. So I'm using them here so that we can start our math, okay? So let's just take this one step at a time. So if we've got a $30,000 annual gross income, the first thing we need to do is get a monthly gross income. So we would take that 30,000 and divide it by 12, which would give us a monthly gross income of $2,500. Now I'm just going to have you to start and then we'll evaluate what this borrower can afford. 
but I'm just going to let you calculate maximum debt and housing debt just to get the party started. So we would take $2,500 times 36%. In your calculator, you would uh, type in 2,500 times 0.36 times 0.36. That would get you $900. For 28%, again, we take this $2,500, $2,500 multiplied by 28% or 0 0.28. So 2,500 times 0 0.28, we're going to get a number of $700. But here's the twist. If this borrower has a $200 a month car payment, and an $80 a month student loan, what's the actual mortgage payment now that they're allowed? So we know that front end and back end ratio number, but now we also know they have $280 worth of debt per month, per month. Per $700 for ITI. Well, if we take 900 minus 700, that only allows $200 worth of wiggle room and we've got $280. So really that means that this borrower's principal and in, um, principal interest tax insurance, their total house payment could actually only be $620, okay? So I already knew that they only had a $200 margin and now we're at 280. So what I did there to get the 620 is I took $900 minus this 280 and I got $620, okay? Because we've got to fit maximum debt, total debt, in that 36% category. And again, even if they hadn't have had that $280 um, car payment and student loan, their maximum house debt would have been this 700. But they carry a little extra debt. So now they're at 620. Let's go on to our $57,000 annual gross income. And we need a monthly gross income, which means we're gonna divide that 57,000 by 12. That is going to give us a monthly gross income of 4750. So $57,000 divided by 12 is 4750. And then let's just do what we did the last time. Let's just take that 47 by 36%. Then let's take it by 28%. And then we'll read on and determine what we can allow. So 4750 multiplied by 36% or 0.36 gives us a number of 1710. And if we do the 4750 again by 28% or 0.28, we get $1,330, okay? So maximum debt is 1710, maximum housing debt is 1330. So now let's read on here because this borrower does already have some monthly debt obligations. They've got a $500 a month car payment and a $100 a month credit card payment. So they already have $600 worth of payment commitments. Can they borrow the full 28% or do they have enough debt that in order to squeeze it in and keep it under 36%, it's gonna start taking away from their house buying power. 
Well, the way I would evaluate that is I would take 1710, the maximum debt of 36%, the 1710 minus $600. Is going to give you this number. It's going to give you $1,110 which means you, this is now what you can borrow for house, not the 1330 because you carry too much debt. So this borrower would either need to eliminate some debt or this would actually be the housing payment that they would qualify for. Let's do one more. We've got a monthly gross income that we need to calculate for. And the annual gross is 180, meaning this person makes $15,000 a month. So again, let's just start off with some habits here of calculating the 36% and then go on and we'll do the 28%. So 15,000 multiplied by 36% or point three, six is going to give you a total debt that this borrower is allowed of $5,400, $5,400. Their total housing debt at 28%, so 15,000 multiplied by 28% or 0 0.20 is going to give you a number of $4,200. So now let's evaluate what this borrower can afford. And this borrower has a $350 a month car payment, um, a credit card payment of 150 and a $50 amount for student loans. So total debt that they already carry is $550 a month. So if we take that 500 500 or sorry $5,400 $5,400 total debt and we subtract the 550 what do we get we get 4850 so this person is in a great position because they do not carry a lot of debt in relationship to their monthly gross income. But can they borrow the full 4850? The answer is no. They can still only do a maximum housing debt of 4200, but the good news for this borrower is that they can do the entire 4200. They don't carry so much other debt that it's starting to impede on their total housing debt allowance, okay? So this borrower, even though they, they could probably charge up their credit cards a little bit, okay, no, bad, bad idea. Make no changes to your credit when you're in this process. Tell your buyers that. Don't spend any money. Don't go to a furniture store and buy furniture before this is closed because then all of these figures change and we got a problem. So still the maximum housing debt for that borrower is $4,200. Okay, discount points. Discount points are used to increase the yield or rate of return on the lender's investment. We learned this during the financing part, and now we're going to do the math around it. A discount point for the math that you must know is it is 1% of the amount borrowed, 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 not the purchase price, not the appraised value, but the amount borrowed. So if we've got a $200,000 purchase price, what would be a 90% loan to value? 
Well, what you would do is you would take $200,000 times 0 0.90. That's 90%. So $200,000 multiplied by 0 0.90 is going to give you a loan value of $180,000, okay? So we're borrowing $180,000, which means three discount points is like 3%. So we would multiply this 80% by 0 0.03, 0 0.03. So the value of those discount points would be $5,400. Which means when this borrower comes to closing, the bank is going to wire in to the closing table $180,000. And then they need to bring their down payment and these discount points. So this borrower, 200,000 minus 180 is $20,000. So their down payment is $20,000 plus this 5,400, they would need to bring $25,400 to the closing table. That's what this means, okay? Let's go on to this one. We've got a $325,000 purchase price and a 70% loan to value. So we're gonna multiply the 325 by 0 .70, 0 0.70, And that's going to give us a loan amount of $227,500. That's the loan amount, the amount borrowed. And now we've got five discount points or 0 0.05. So if we take $227,500, um, multiplied by 5%. That gives us a value of discount points of $11,375. We'll do a third one here. We want a 95% um, loan to value, which means we would multiply $110,000 by 0.95. That gives us a loan amount of 104,500. And we need four discount points or 0 0.04. So the value of those discount points is gonna be $4,180. If you're feeling like you wanna rewatch this video, that's okay. That's okay. I just care that you pass the exam, that you get there. You study this however you need to. I know you need to get through it and you're not done yet. Um, you've got quite a ways to go to finish this course. But I also know you maybe all be learning at, at different times, okay? But here's what those math numbers were. I'm gonna do a little bit of a tricky one here for you. We've got a purchase price of 200 and an appraised value of 195. Loan to value of 90%. So which number can the lender use to calculate all the financing math? That's right, purchase price or appraised value, whichever is less which means we've got to work with this $195,000. So a 90% loan to value is gonna be 0 0.90, meaning that we've now got a loan amount that the lender will participate in of $175,500, $175,500. Now that is our amount borrowed, borrowed.
And now we can do our discount points. We want two of them and a discount point is worth 1% each. So this would be 2% or 0 0.20, meaning the value of those discount points, 175.5 times 0 0.02, gives us $3,510. So if we wanna know, here is our goal right here. What's the total amount needed for closing? So we know that we need these discount points of 35.5. We've gotta make up a difference between what we said that the, we would tell pay the seller. We've gotta pay the seller but the appraised value is only 195. So we've got to make up the difference for the seller and bring them $5,000. And then we've got to bring our down payment. What's the down payment? Well, if we take 195.5, sorry, 195 minus 175.5, so 195,000 minus 1755, we've got a down payment of 19,500. So if we've got to bring our discount points, our down payment, and this difference in value, the total amount needed to bring to closing by that borrower is gonna be $28,010. Okay, see what we did there? We've got to make the seller whole. We've got to bring our discount points and we've got to bring our down payment. Okay, now for your career, what does really happen if the appraised value comes in lower than the purchase price? And I just want to reiterate to you what could happen. Number one, the seller could concede and just drop the price down to the 195. Number two, the buyer has to make up the difference because that's what they said they would do in the purchase agreement. And number three is they could agree to split it 50-50, 70-30, 30-70, 60-40, 40-60, 60, 40, 60, or whatever variation you negotiate. Now, when you're writing purchase agreements for your buyers that are getting financing, you're not only going to want to write that subject to financing because they've got to get a loan or they cannot buy the house. You're also going to want to write it subject to appraisal, which means if this doesn't appraise at the value that you've agreed to, you've got a parachute for your buyer. Okay. And those will be a couple check marks on the purchase agreement that I see on all standard contracts. Um, that I've gotten to see at least in my career, that you very, very easily, you'll have a memory point to make sure that you get that um, checked for your buyers. Again, so they've got that uh, parachute. Here's kind of our last project, is this amortization schedule. I had a link for it in your materials and you maybe did not click to open it, but it will be something that we will be needing now. This amortization schedule, let me just start by saying, if you go to one of the three test locations here in Iowa, there will be a version of this laminated and taped to the desk at each cubicle. You do not need to memorize this. Phew, I'd even give up if I had to memorize this. No, you do not need to memorize it. At the test center, I believe that it even will say this per 1,000 based on per 1,000. What this amortization schedule has done is they've already done the algorithm and the alignment of the math for you based on 
every $1,000 you borrow, how much is it going to cost you? Based on your interest rate and the term of the loan. The term of the loan is the length of it in years. 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Most mortgages are 15 and 30 years. There'll be some others, but those will be probably the most common for you. So this mortgage factor chart is calculating the principal and interest payment. So a PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance, is gonna figure the principal and interest. Then you can find out through your county what the taxes are per year divided by 12, add that on there. And then maybe a small half percent to 1% would cover them for insurance. Now you can start building house payments for folks. For example, at an open house, if they're curious what their payment would be based on what maybe cash they have, they maybe haven't spoken to a lender yet. You can help get that conversation rolling. So here's how we work with this. We take the amount borrowed, 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 um, not the purchase price, but the amount being borrowed from the lender. We divide that number by 1,000 and that's gonna give us units. Then we are going to read the test question and find out the interest rate and the term or length of the loan. And based on the term, term goes this way, and the interest rate, you are going to find a factor number. Boop, boop, factor number. And the number of units that when that you came up with when you divided by a thousand, multiply that by the factor number. And that's going to get you your principal and interest payment. Okay. Now I will admit I don't love this factor chart, <laughs> but it was the best one I could find. And here's why. The one at the test center is unique to me because most factor charts I found to share with you only had 15 and 30 years on it, which is fine because that's typically maybe the loans that you're gonna be using. But for the exam, they've got 15, 20, 25, 30, 40 years on their chart, landscape piece of paper. So I wanted to pull something for you to show an example of a type of test question they might use. Now, please listen here. When we find the factor number for this exercise, I just want you to use two numbers after the decimal point. So if it says 7.45968, 7.45968, we are only going to use 7.45, okay? Just for this exercise, and from what I know at the exam test center, it just goes two numbers. That's why I'm doing it this way. Now, if you are doing this exam from home, you're doing it at home proctored exam, you cannot have this sheet printed out on your own, taped to your desk. My understanding is you will be able to use a version of it on their program, but not, you can't have it be a separate piece of paper just on your own. So let's dive in because I've actually got a lot of examples of this. Sorry, more than my three rule. Um, my uh, do it three times rule. Of your eight test questions, this is where I think you could have multiple of the same question. So that's why I want to add a few other scenarios that could come up. So let's start off nice and easy. Amount borrowed. So we're not even needing to calculate loan to value yet. We're just telling you that the amount borrowed is 
$112,700. Okay. We're going to divide that by a thousand. And that equals 212.70. I'm going to call that the number of units that they're borrowing. The number of units that they're borrowing. Now we've got an interest rate here of five and three eighths for 15 years. Five and three eighths is 5.375 as a percentage. And if we go back to the chart and we look under 15 years down to 5.375, we get a mortgage factor number of 8.10. 8.10. And then what we do it with that number is we multiply it by these units of 212.70, 212.70. So take the factor number 8.10 multiplied by 212.70 you're gonna get a principal and interest payment of $1,722.87. $1,722.87. Now we're gonna get into it a little bit because now we need to start figuring this you in combination. So if we've got a $195,000 purchase price and a 90% loan to value, we'll multiply by 0 0.90, 0 0.90. That means we've got an amount that we're borrowing of $175,500. And again, if we divide that by a thousand, that's always the formula, just divide it by a thousand. That's why I reminded you about on that sheet, it kind of gives you a little cheat hint, divide it by per 1,000. That's going to give you 175.7 units. That's the number of units that they're borrowing. Now let's go find our factor number for 4.5% interest rate for 30 years. So go over to the chart 30 years and go down to 4.5% interest rate. Again, we're just gonna use the first two numbers after the decimal point, which got, gives us a factor number of 5.06. And if we multiply that by 175.5, the number of units that we're borrowing that gives us a principal and interest payment of $883.03. How are we doing? You know, I don't know. Here's what I used to do. Um, back in the day when I got my real estate license, we were told we had to have a business calculator, like a fancy business calculator that did all this amortization fancy stuff on it. And it was like $80. And I got all my pennies together as a new agent after I paid for all these classes like you're doing. I got all my pennies together. I bought this calculator. I could never figure out how to use it. I had it for about three months. I dropped it getting out of my SUV and it shattered. And I will be honest with you, I did not have another $80 to replace it. It's like, oh, what am I gonna do? Well, that year I got a calendar from a lender. One of those pocket calendars, kind of old fashioned now because we've got our cell phones, but an old fashioned pocket calculator. And it had this amortization schedule in it on like two or three pages, right? Well, what I did at the end of the year, well, first of all, I started taking that calendar and I used it to actually write down my appointments and get organized. But I started taking it with me to open houses 
And I started asking people at my opens, you know, do you know anything about how much your house payment would be? Have you talked to a lender? That was one of my opening questions to get to know people. Has anyone talked to you about the money? How much it would cost to buy this house? And I would just say, would you mind sharing with me, you know, if you're not working with an agent, would you mind sharing with me maybe what you have for a down payment? And then I would do the loan to value. I would pull out my trusty little calculator. I knew rates at the time were, back at this time, they were 5%, so high. Um, and I would do a 30 year term and I would give them PAI. I knew what the taxes were. I divided that by 12 and I gave a little different. And then I gave them an estimate of what their payment would be. And I wrote all of this down on the back of their open house flyer. So they would have those notes. And if they were renting, I would even start letting them know if they wrote an offer now, how they could sync it up with their lease um, expiring. So they would have a couple months to move out, blah, 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 right? Well, I use that so much, guys, that then when the year was over, I tore out these amortization pages that were the interest rate at the time. And I laminated them into little cards like uh, credit card size. And I took those with me to my open houses. And every once in a while, I've got a lender late at night that's not available. We're writing an offer. We want to know if we go up five grand, how much it's going to impact their score or impact their payment. So I do use this, not a lot. Um, for the most part, the lender will use it. But this is why it's important for you to understand the concept. Okay, there's my story. Let's go on to the next one. We've got a purchase price of 160,000 and a loan to value of 80%. So 160,000, again, we're gonna multiply that by 0 0.80, which is gonna give us a loan amount, the amount we're borrowing of $128,000. And if we divide that by a thousand, our units is 128. So now let's go find our factor number again, pull out that chart and go over to 15 years and drop down to 5.25. That gives you a factor number of 8.03. And if we multiply that by the number of units we're borrowing at 128, that gives a principal and interest payment of $1,027.84. $1,027.84. So those are our three big rocks to review. I wanted to give you a couple of other test questions here though that I have seen formatted. And one was a situation where you had to figure two payments and what they want to know is, is the difference. So if we've got a loan amount of $235,000, again, this is the loan amount. We don't need to figure out loan to value because they're telling us what the loan amount is. So if we divide that by a thousand, that's gonna give us 235 units that we're borrowing. Units is what I'm calling it. So that we don't confuse it with dollars. Then if we've got an interest rate of 5 point, uh, sorry, 4.25 for 15 years versus an interest rate of 4.25 for 30 years, What's the difference in the house payment? They wanna know the difference. So we've gotta calculate this bad debt at 15 years and then do it again at 30 years, subtract one from the other to get the difference. So what's our factor number? What's our factor number for um, 4.25, go over to 15 years, 
that factor number is 7.52. Seven point five two. If we multiply that by the two hundred thirty five units, we get a house payment of one thousand seven hundred sixty seven dollars twenty cents. So two hundred and thirty five units, mortgage factor number of seven point five two, gives us a PI payment of $1,767.20. So if we've got that down here again, we've still again got 235 units, but what's the factor number for a four and a quarter interest rate now for 30 years? For 30 years, that factor number is 4.91. If we multiply those, we get a principal and interest payment of $1,153.85. And now it wants to know the difference. So you've got to subtract 1767.20 minus $1,153.85. And what's your difference? Your difference is $613.33. That's what the question's actually wanting to know. Now, yet another style of question I've seen is it wants to know the maximum number of years you can borrow and still keep a payment under a certain threshold. So the example I'm giving you is, what's the maximum loan term for a mortgage of $185,000 at an interest rate of 6.25 and still keeping the payment under $1,300? which means if we've got 185 divided by 1,000, that's going to give us 185 units. So we know that number but now we've got to use that against all of these factor numbers. So you're going to go to 6.25. And what is the mortgage factor number for 10 years? The mortgage factor number for 10 years is 11.22. Um, again, still 6.25%. The factor number for 15 years is going to be 8.57 for 20 years. Move along over the line. The factor number goes to 7.30. See how it goes down the longer the term of the loan, the payment's less. For 25 years, now we're at a factor number of 6.59. And for 30 years, we keep moving right on that chart. We now have a factor number of 6.15, which means you've got to start multiplying all of these times 185 multiplied times 185. To see how long the term of the loan can be before it goes over $1,300 a month. And guys, you can start in the middle, you can start wherever you want. I'm gonna take it from the top though, and we're gonna do 11.22 times 185. 11.22 times 185. 
This is going to give us a payment of 2075 70 cents, $2,075 and 70 cents. One eighty seven times one hundred and eighty five. This is going to give us a payment of fifteen eighty five forty five, one thousand five hundred eighty five dollars and forty five cents. Um, Seven point three zero is going to give us um, when it's multiplied by one eighty five is going to give us a number of. 135050 $1,350.50. Moving on to 25 years with a factor number of uh, 6.59, again, multiplied by 185. This gives us a factor number of 1,000. $219.15. Oh, we're getting close. We're still under $1,300. What's going to happen? Now, for 30 years, we've got a factor number of 6.15, again, multiplied by the 185 units. And that gives us a number of $1,137 and 75 cents. So what's the maximum number of years that we can borrow and not go over $1,300 in the payment? Well, 20 years goes over, but 25 years does not. So your answer here is 25 years. That's the term or length of the loan. Again, I think that you could have Multiple test questions. Um, I know I've mentioned I audit the exam yearly. The Real Estate Commission lets me do that um, to gain some insight. I've had some exams where half of my eight math questions were just on this mortgage factor chart. And again, the chart will be there for you. Always divide the amount borrowed by a thousand. Use that chart to find your factor number and you will have success. Up next, we're gonna talk about prorating taxes.